The bulk of Watchmen's praise comes from its complex philosophical plot and flawed characters, but what makes the novel work are these ideas augmented by a striking and sophisticated visual presentation. Watchmen's panel division is rigidly formal, broken into a 3x3 three three arrangement that only deviates with fractional subdivisions of the original form. Panels are combined or split in half, but never do they branch into the more experimental forms of page layout that contemporary illustrators were implementing. Where comic artists such as Frank Miller were filling their pages with circular panels, irregular geometry, and panels within panels, Watchmen maintains geometric unity with a neoclassical obsession. These techniques fill the comic through subtle repetitions of geometric form and visual motif, but appear most conspicuously in the fifth issue, Fearful Symmetry, where the first page mirrors the last, the second page mirrors the next to last, and so on. Examining the centerfold, where Adrian Veidt takes down his would-be assassin, is the most obvious moment of this motif. Veidt's upswing contrasts with his assailant's fall, and these two actions are in turn balanced by the downward and then upward diagonal stroke of the V in the background. The assailant's head is furthermore balanced with the gold statue, and in each corner of the panel is a small splash, while the arc of Veidt's swing forms a symmetrical half-circle and his own head is balanced by the assailant's gun. The three panels on either side of the climactic moment illustrate the initiation, midpoint, and termination of an action by Veidt, so that the two pages play out in a kind of compressed Fatag's pyramid. For a visual comparison, look at Renaissance painter Botticelli's The Birth of Venus. Note first the classical form and pose of these figures, but also note the mathematical obsession by which it was composed. Like Moore and Gibbon's obsession with symmetry, Botticelli incorporates the golden ratio, or the irrational number phi, into every aspect of his work. It can be found in the size of the canvas, the ratio of sky to sea, the length of the figures from navel to head and navel to foot, and even the ratio of images in the foreground to the total size of the painting, all exhibiting this same ratio. It's visually striking, but in an allegorical and mathematical way, not an emotional one like you might find in the landscapes of William Turner or Claude Monet. In Watchmen 2, the form creates a work that is aesthetically pleasing but somewhat cold and cerebral. Unlike the less organized panel layout and structured form of some of its contemporaries, the form of Watchmen acts in opposition to the sometimes greatly emotional content of the novel and inhibits the reader's direct involvement. This, coupled with the heavy philosophical overtones of the plot, indicate that Watchmen is a text primarily designed to make you think rather than make you feel. Complementing this are heroes who wouldn't look out of place in a Roman statue garden with their square jaws, muscular proportion, and in the case of Dr. Manhattan, understated genitalia. Not just a classical illusion, this draws also from the tradition of much older comics, standing in contrast to other artists who are exploring increasingly dark imagery to accompany increasingly dark plots, but also serving as a critique of the direction of the mainstream comic industry was headed. In 1984, DC held its 50th anniversary, and the comics began to return to the look of its heyday. Moore himself contributed to this neo-silver age with his 1986 two-run comic, Whatever Happened to the Man of Tomorrow, which brought all of Superman's existing storylines to a close before its reboot. Nostalgia serves as one of the major themes of Watchmen, and this visual style allows us to see the world through the rose-tinted view that many of its characters see it, but it also serves Moore and Gibbon's deconstruction of the genre. Visually, the characters of Watchmen are cliché, borrowing imagery both from the charlatan characters that they originated from and comic characters as a whole. Dan Dryberg is as much the Blue Beetle as he is a middle-aged Clark Kent figure in a parody of Batman, while Rorschach draws as much from the question as he does the shadow in the novels of authors such as Raymond Chandler and Dashiell Hammett. It implies a depth, depth of argument beyond the text itself that can be applied to comics or life in general. It also blurs the dichotomy between good and evil often present in superhero comics. Watchmen is not divided into black and white, and while occasionally heroes had been aged or darkened, rarely is there an antagonist as noble looking as fight. While this accentuates the evening's twist, it also breaks the comic convention of making its villains look evil or deformed. The Joker, the Penguin, the Green Goblin, Doctor Doom all look evil, and female villains often have an over-sexualized femme fatale sneer. Rather, the visual tone of the comic is much more relative. For example, in issue 6, as Kovacs is being interrogated, the novel panels darken not with opposing forces but with the darkening mood of the psychiatrist. 
Good and evil are blurred textually and visually, accentuating the more de luma of the final scenes. The decision to play with comic book conventions plays on other parts of the novel as well to a similarly weighty effect. There's a vein of realism that cuts through the conventional aspects of the text that occurs in both the context and in the structure. In the place of motion lines, Gibbon uses blood, smoke, water, snow, or other environmental fluids to suggest motion. Environmental onomatopoeia is similarly absent. Likewise, instead of omniscient narration, Moore uses dialogue to frame scenes, often having it laid over contrasting or corresponding moments. They even drop the editorial letters that would often serve as a coda for issues, instead including faux historical documents from the, within the narrative of the text. Essentially, what Moore and Gibbon provide is a critique of what the comic had become. The visual complexity of Watchmen proves that the genre can transcend a pulp aesthetic or visual chaos and become something with significantly more literary and artistic weight.